St. Anselm's Ontological Argument In this video, we're going to look closely at an argument by St. Anselm that's known as the Ontological Argument. But before you watch this video, make sure to complete the reading for this week. It's very short. So I didn't have you read the prologue, but in the prologue, Anselm explains how it is that he came to write Proslogoion, the writing that this argument comes from. We find out that he'd published a previous work investigating the, the rational basis of faith when he noticed that he'd written it by chaining together many different kinds of arguments. And this made him wonder if he could find a single argument that alone could be used as proof for God's existence. Now, if you followed the instructions at the beginning of this video, you've done the reading for today. So, if when you did the reading, you had no idea what was going on, that's okay. This is a very, very hard piece of philosophy. It's very short, but very difficult, and perhaps it's one of the hardest readings that we're going to look at during the whole quarter. Our strategy for today is going to involve working through chapter 2 line by line. And when we do this, we're going to discover that an argument emerges. So, we'll start at the beginning. So, Lord, you, who reward faith with understanding, let me understand, insofar as you see fit, whether you are as we believe, and whether you are what we believe you to be. Here, Anselm is pointing out that God provides people who have faith in God understanding. Anselm's asking God to allow him to understand if God exists as we believe God to exist, and if God is what we believe God to be. Now, <laughs> this part of the reading actually isn't crucial for the argument, and there's kind of a nice lesson hidden in here. So sometimes when we're looking at arguments for this class, uh, parts of them will go directly into the final version of the argument, and other times some of the things that we looked at are just included for context. So the opening line of this passage is just included for context. It's not a crucial part of the argument. Okay, now let's move on. We believe you to be something than which nothing greater can be conceived. Here, Anselm is explaining how it is that he understands God. But what does it mean to believe that God is something than which nothing greater can be conceived? Something than which nothing greater can be conceived. What, what does this mean? Okay, so think about the greatest thing that you can think of whatever it is, whether it's the greatest thing in terms of size, the greatest thing in terms of power, the greatest thing in terms of importance, the greatest thing in terms of perfection, uh, or maybe something so great that it has all of these characteristics, all right? So what is it that you're thinking of? Anselm's claim is that whatever the greatest thing is that you can think of, that you can conceive, God is greater than that. Okay? And this gives us the first premise in our argument. God is something than which nothing greater can be conceived. And I've shortened that there as S-T-W-N-G-C-B-C, -C, something than which nothing greater can be conceived, to sort of save us some space as we move forward. All right. From the first premise, the argument continues. The question, then, is whether something with this nature exists, since the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. Psalms 14.1 and 53.1. What does this mean? What's going on here? Here, Anselm is recognizing that some people, including the fool cited in the two Psalms, says that there is no God. And this is a challenge that any proof for God's existence needs to reply to, right? 
So any argument that we come up with that has the conclusion that God exists is going to have to have a response to that person who just says, uh, no, no, he doesn't. No, God doesn't exist. All right? And this is what Anselm is setting up here. Okay? He's saying that uh, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. And any argument that we present is going to have to face this challenge. Now we'll see that Anselm has a very unique way of facing this challenge. So let's continue. But surely, when the fool hears the words, something than which nothing greater can be conceived, he understands what he hears, and what he understands exists in his understanding, even if he doesn't think that it exists. For it's one thing, for an object to exist in someone's understanding, and another for him to think that it exists. Okay. So what's going on here? Well, when the fool hears that God is something than which nothing greater can be conceived, he understands what these words mean, according to Anselm. This is the same way that they made sense to you after I explain them, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully they're starting to make sense, right? Okay, so we might think about this as the fool grasping the concept of God as something than which nothing greater can be conceived. All right, so you can understand what something is even if you don't think that that thing exists. All right. So, for example, think of a dragon or a unicorn. I can understand what a unicorn is without believing that a unicorn exists. This is what Ansel means when he says, for it's one thing for an object to exist in someone's understanding, and another thing for him to think that it exists. It's one thing for a unicorn to exist in your understanding, right? Just like a unicorn exists in all of your understandings. And it's another thing to think that it exists. All right? So we can understand what we hear. I know what you're talking about when you use the word unicorn. Even if we don't believe that this thing exists, I don't actually believe that unicorns exist. However, According to Anselm, when we understand what we hear, this thing exists in our understanding, okay? So because I understand the word unicorn, the concept of unicorn exists in my understanding. All right, so all of this gives us premise number two. So premise one, God is something in which nothing greater can be conceived. And now two, when we understand something, that thing exists in our understanding. And these two together, premises one and two, give us premise three. So God is something in which nothing greater can be conceived. When we understand something, that thing exists in our understanding. And so God as something in which nothing greater can be conceived exists in our understanding. Okay, I think that this is fairly straightforward, I hope. Let's move on. And surely, that than which a greater cannot be conceived cannot exist just in the understanding. If it were to exist just in the understanding, we could conceive it to exist in reality too, in which case it would be greater. Therefore, if that than which a greater cannot be conceived exists just in the understanding, the very thing than which a greater cannot be conceived is something than which a greater can be conceived. Okay, so my guess is that this is sort of the point in the argument where if you were kind of following along okay, uh, now you have no idea what's going on, and that's all right. That's all right. We're going to go through it sentence by sentence. 
and surely that than which a greater cannot be conceived cannot exist just in the understanding. So here I think we can think of Anselm as asking a question. When we understand God as something than which nothing greater can be conceived, this understanding of God cannot exist only in the understanding, can it? This is how we should think of what Anselm's asking here. And then he answers his question. If it were to exist just in the understanding, we could conceive it to exist in reality too, in which case it would be greater. So, if this understanding of God as something in which nothing greater can be conceived were to exist only in the understanding, we could imagine that it could also exist in reality too, right? That's a possible thing that we could imagine, just in the same way that we can imagine a unicorn existing both in our understanding and in reality. That's something that we can imagine. Okay. And if this understanding of God, something in which nothing greater can be conceived, existed in both our understanding and in reality, this understanding of God would be greater, right? Because it exists in both places. All right. So the idea here is that God existing in both our understanding and in reality would lead to a God that was greater than a God that exists just in our understanding. Therefore, if that than which a greater cannot be conceived existed just in the understanding, the very thing than which a greater cannot be conceived is something than which a greater can be conceived. So, if we understand God as something than which nothing greater can be conceived, then God cannot exist only in our understanding. Because, if this understanding of God did exist only in our understanding, there would be something greater, namely the God that existed both in our understanding and in reality. Okay, so this has gotten us most of the way. This is where the fourth premise comes in. God is something in which nothing greater can be conceived. When we understand something that exists, when we understand something, that thing exists in our understanding. So God, something in which nothing greater can be conceived, exists in our understanding. And the fourth premise. But if God really is something in which nothing greater can be conceived, then God must not only exist in our understanding, but he must also exist in reality. Because if God didn't also exist in reality, there would be something greater, namely the being that existed both in our understanding and in reality. The problem is that this is a contradiction. And this leads us to the conclusion. But surely this cannot be. That's the part where Anselm's saying this is a contradiction. Without a doubt, then, something which then which a greater can't be conceived does exist, both in the understanding and reality. Right? This can't be. So God must exist both in our understanding and in reality. And this gives us the ontological argument. God is something in which nothing greater can be conceived. When we understand something, that thing exists in our understanding. So God, as something in which nothing greater can be conceived, exists in our understanding. But, if God really is something greater than which nothing something than which nothing greater can be conceived, then God must not exist only in our understanding, but he must also exist in reality. Because if God didn't also exist in reality, there'd be something greater, namely the being that existed both in our understanding and reality. And this is a contradiction. So, God exists both in our understanding and in reality. Okay, so that was a lot, I'm sure, 
and I'm sure that you have a lot of questions, please do your best to complete the assignment for this week and watch the next video, which is going to go into some common misunderstandings for this argument in a little more depth and will hopefully help you understand it better. Thanks a lot.